In the spring of 2019, we were coming back from the Mason House Inn in Keosauqua, Iowa. The Mason House was initially built to accommodate steamboat travelers nearly two centuries ago. In the past, the Mason House was a Civil War hospital. It was a station on the Underground Railroad and a sanatorium for those suffering from consumption. In 1972, the hotel was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. In 2019, Chuck and Joy Hansen were our hosts at what is now a historic bed and breakfast, and as usual, our stay did not disappoint. Of course, we couldn't just drive straight home. We have to stop at every cemetery on the way. On this particular adventure, we stopped at Bonaparte. The cemetery there is a good size. It's pretty well kept. There's a little bit of decay around the edges, but that's to be expected. So I was walking around photographing some of the headstones, and I noticed a set of headstones that matched. Now that's not unusual for a family to have matching headstones, but it is a little strange for them all to have the same expiration date. It really stuck with me. It still sticks with me. So I'm going to tell you the story now. October 14th, 2006, 3.38 a.m., 911 receives a call from a terrified teenage girl. The caller is 14-year-old Shayna Bentler. She tells the dispatcher that her mother instructed her to call. Her mother, 47-year-old Sandra, can be heard in the background screaming, Sean, no, Sean, don't. The dispatcher hears a popping sound. And then Shana screams, Sean, no, before the call is dropped. 911 receives a second call, but there's no one on the line. Dispatch makes an effort to reconnect with that line, but it goes to the voicemail of Shelby Bentler, a 15-year-old Harmony High School student. Sean was born on February 5, 1984, to Sandra Mendez and Michael Bentler. The couple married five months later and welcomed three more children, daughters Sheena, Shelby, and Shayna. By all accounts, the Bentler kids had a good childhood. They were athletic, and the girls especially excelled in academics. Sean's senior year of high school, a friend of his claimed that he had started to change. Sean seemed to be developing quite a sense of entitlement, bragging about his family's wealth, Sure, he's put in some hours at the lumber yard, but he shows little interest in achieving his own success. After graduation, he moves to Quincy, Illinois, about an hour and 20 minutes from the family estate in Bonaparte. He planned on attending community college there, but after only a semester, he dropped out. Sean's first child, Chloe, is born in 2002, and as you can guess, he's pretty spotty with the old child support payments. Sean moves back to Bonaparte and goes back to work with his dad. The gig pays well, but at the end of the day, Sean doesn't want to work. He drifts back to Quincy and works on and off until he meets Lexi Leslie. She becomes his second baby mama. Avalie is born in 2005. In 2006, our guy's working at a car dealership, and I can only imagine that his attendance is as spotty as his child support payments because he tells his boss, I'm guessing as an excuse for his absences, that his father's dead. He tells his boss that Big Mike's had a heart attack and passed away. So the boss, like any decent person, calls to offer the family his condolences, and they're shocked. They're like, what? Mike's dead. He forgot to lay down because he's right here. So Sean's boss understandably fires him from the position at the dealership. Later that month, Sean misses a court date for possession of paraphernalia. Things really seem to be piling up for him, and he could probably call up the folks and go back to work with his dad, pay his debts and fines, but then he'd have to, you know, work. In the early morning hours of October 14th, Sean borrowed his roommate's car and drove to his family's estate on the banks of the Des Moines River. Sean crept into the house and went to the basement where his father's gun cabinet was. He selected a 22 caliber rifle and headed for his sister Sheena's room. Sheena died in her bed, but the round woke his mother. Next, he went to his parents' room. Here he proceeds to shoot Sandra in the face. The mother who adored him so much, they talked on the phone nearly every day. The bullet passes through Sandra's jaw. Bleeding and stunned, Sandra wakes Mike. Mike lunged for Sean. Sean struck him in the head with the butt of the rifle. He fires around into Mike's leg and then fatally in the head. By this time, Sandra's running down the hallway screaming for the girls to call 911. Shana connected with dispatch first and Sandra can be heard in the background pleading with her only son for her life. He shoots her at the top of the stairs and turns his attention to Shayna. He shoots her through the phone. Shelby's hiding in her closet. He shoots her in the head as well. 
but Sean, always the underachiever, has left his cell phone in the hallway where his mother is killed. Quincy police are alerted to what's happened back in Bonaparte, and they pick Sean up for questioning. Iowa DCI agents travel to Quincy where they are holding Sean for driving on a suspended license and a warrant for failure to appear on the paraphernalia charge. Detectives collect his clothes and book him. At trial, Sean continued to deny any involvement, even though his family ID'd him to 911. He tried to explain away the fact that he'd left his phone at the scene, but his phone records showed that he had made phone calls late at the evening of the 13th. Tire impressions left at the scene matched his roommate's vehicle, and he confirmed that Sean would have had access to the vehicle the night of the 13th. The clothes they collected from him at the jail? Well, one of the socks had a drop of blood. DNA confirmed it to be Sandra's. The judge gave Sean five life sentences, four of which will run concurrently, one to be served consecutively, with the intention that Sean will never walk free again.